Good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you are and, of course, what time it is. So, today we will cover how to run loops in R. So, ah, got an email. Ah, read that later. So, in many analysis tasks, you're going to want to perform some calculation or procedure multiple times and perhaps over one or more index variables. So, for example, you might have a data set with different measurements for, uh, let's say, you've uh, collected GPA data uh, from different schools and you want to create a loop that calculates some information about each of the different schools. Now, loops are helpful because they allow you to repeat many procedures very easily over many different things. So, a typical for loop has two elements, um, an index that's looped over, or looping over, and some action, what you are doing with each element in the index. Oops. So let's do a simple for loop where we calculate the numbers from 1 to 10, or I should say integers. Now, of course, we already know how to do this very easily using um, the colon or sequence. Uh, these will both give it to you, but let's use a loop instead just so we can see how it works. So before setting up the loop, it's a good idea to create, um, um, oh, what did I call this, create a um, placeholder. And this is where your final results will be. So I'm going to create a final placeholder. I'll call it a result. And I'm just going to be filling it with uh, NAs uh, with 10 of them. So again, if I look at this result, then it's just a vector of 10 NAs. And I'm going to fill this with the numbers 1 to 10. So the way to create a for loop is you start by writing 4 and then left parenthesis, and then a, um, an object name that will represent what you're indexing over. You'll see what this means in a second. So I'll say for i in 1 to 10, oops, in 1 to 10, and then open um, bracket, and then I'll say result, and I'll index by i, and I'll assign that just to i. So what this will do is it'll loop through i from 1 to 10, and then for each i, it will take the ith element of result and assign that to i. Now, of course, this is incredibly absurd because I already have my answer right here. But in any event, uh, let's go ahead and run this. And then if I look at what result is, I see that it's numbers 1 to 10. So, yeah, it worked. Not so, not so difficult. Um, so again, basic elements of the loop. You want to know, you want to set up a placeholder, and then this is my index from 1 to 10, and I'm going to call that i, and then the ith element of result, or, or sorry, this is the general action here, and the action is all a function of i. Um, but of course, we can do some more complicated simulations. So let's do a simple simulation on p values using a loop. So we know from our definition of p-values that a p-value is the probability of getting a certain test statistic given that the null hypothesis is true. So this is what we're told all the time. Let's make sure that's really correct. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to create a simulation where I draw se uh, 10 samples from a standard normal distribution and of course, for a standard normal distribution, the null hypothesis is true. So it's a normal with mean 10 and standard deviation 1. And I'm going to do this uh, 10,000 times. And for each one of these draws of 10, I'm going to calculate the p-value that's comparing the sample mean to uh, our hypothesized null, our null hypothesis that the true population mean is 0. Now, if the if our definition of p-values is correct, then the proportion of times that I get a p-value less than 0.05 should be exactly 0.05. So let's do this. Now the first thing I'm going to do is define the number of simulations. 
and I'm going to say it's 10,000. And now again, I'm going to create a placeholder, and that will be, I'll call that p-values, and I'm going to again make uh, it full of na, so repeat na, and I'm going to do the n dot sim times. So that'll create 10,000 na values. And now I'll create my for loop, so for i and 1 to n sim. So our only index here is n.sim, open bracket, and here, let me open this up a bit. And then, so what do I want to do for each of these? The first thing I'm going to do is create the sample data. So I'll say sample data is our norm of 10 in this case. Um, so again, because I said it was 10 samples, now we could change this or later on we'll run a simulation where we change this as well, but for now we'll keep it at 10. And mean is 0, SD equals 1. Okay. And now our test statistic will be t test oops, of sample data. And now I want to extract the p value from this. And the way I do that, so current p value for the current test statistic. So I could be more careful with this. I could say current test statistic current sample data, t-test of current data, just to emphasize that this is the, um, the outcome for this run of the simulation. And yeah, so going back to the current value, p-value, that'll be the current test statistic, and that's going to be the p-value in that. Now, once I've got the p-value, I can assign that to our placeholder. So p-values, and I'm going to index it on i, and I will load the current p-value to this. And that's it. And then I just close the bracket to close the loop, and this should be good. Now, right now I have 10,000 simulations, which this will actually run pretty fast. But let's say I want to make sure that um, this isn't going to take too long. So I'll just start it with 10 to see if I have any errors. So I'll go ahead and run this. And it looked OK. And let's see what's in p-values. All right, that all looks good. So now let me bump this back up to 10,000, and run it. OK, so now what I'm going to do uh, to look at the results is first I'm going to create a new vector called p-values less than 05. And I'm going to assign this to our original p-values data uh, vector. But now I'm just going to create a logical vector where I say whether or not it's less than or equal to 0.05. So let's look at. Uh, p-values, and you see we have these p-values, and let's see what it, the, uh, the logical vector does. So it says for each one of these p-values, is it less than or equal to 0.05? And we can see that's true for the first one, but for all the rest of these, they're all greater, so they're all false. And the final result that I want is the mean of p-values less than 0.05. So let's run that, and let's see what the result is. And lo and behold, we get 0.0531. So like we predicted, um, the probability of getting a p-value less than 0.05, assuming that the null is true, again, we know it's true, because we drew the samples from a normal distribution with mean 10, is indeed 0.05. And if we wanted to, we could actually look at a histogram of the final result. Maybe ask yourself for a question Oh, not at the final result, but at the p-values. And you might ask yourself, what should the histogram of p-values look like? So from 0 to 1, how likely should it be that the p-values are small, medium, high? Should there be a difference, or should they be all the same? Maybe think for a second about what you expect, and now let's look at it. Oops, I had a... hold on. I had MF row on before. Let me just do this again. Okay. So as you can see, it's pretty much uniform. So under the null hypothesis, we see that all p-values are equally likely. Now there's some random noise here, but if we bumped the simulations up to 10,000, or uh, to more than 10,000, this would be pretty much horizontal. OK, so that's how we do a simple simulation uh, using one index variable. But Frequently, we might want to use two index variables. So for example, in this simulation, I just had simulations. That's it. But what if we wanted to repeat the simulation, but we wanted to know, 
is there an effect there's is there an effect of the sample size on um, the probability of getting a p-value less than 0.05 maybe someone would think yeah with small sample sizes it's equally likely to get all p all p-values but maybe if you had a sample size of a hundred or a thousand then a p-value of less than 0.05 might be more or less likely assuming the null is true so we can go ahead and do this um, so more complex loop with multiple index variables because I'm a bit OCD I don't want that extra space ah, okay um, so now we want the number of simulations uh, and that's from 1 to 10,000 but we also want sample size and let's say we want sample sizes of 10, 50, 100, 1,000. Okay, and if, if there is an effective sample size on this distribution of p-values, we'd probably see it here. Um, now, you might think that the way we do this is to run two separate loops over a number of simulations and sample size. So instead of just having for i and 1 to sim, and yeah, for i and 1 to n sim, we could have for j and uh, c 10, 50, 100, 1000, and then we uh, uh, have to create an open bracket, and then we'd have to create another, we'd have to change this to j, and then create another loop, but this is a bit cumbersome, and you can imagine that if you have many things that you're um, many more index variables, so you had like 10 index variables, then you're going to have to have 10 of these loops, and that's going to start to get um, pretty ugly pretty quickly. So I, what I found is that there's a better way to do this um, using design, what I call design matrices. Which is, yeah, And I, maybe other people have other names for this, or maybe actually I stole this name from someone else and I just forgot the source of that knowledge, but either way. So what a design matrix is, is it stores all combinations of ind index variables into one matrix, which you can then um, loop over the rows of the matrix and extract the or extract all index values. So what does that mean? Well, Let's imagine that we wanted to um, make some calculation on all combinations of the letters A, B, C, and the numbers 1, 2, 3. So what I'd like is a matrix where uh, it has, on each row, it has a value of le uh, letter and a value of number, and it gives me all combinations of the letters and numbers. Now the easy way to do this is by using the expand.grid function in R, and I'll show you how this works in a second. So the first thing we do is say, uh, define the first index. So letter will be A, B, and C. And the second index is number, and that's gonna be one, two, three. Now, if I run this, you'll see what it does is expand.grid will take these two vectors and give us all combinations of them. So this just makes it easy. Instead of me having to manually create all of these combinations using other functions, expand.grid does it really easily. So now what I can do in my simulation is I can just do a loop over the rows of this design matrix, and for each loop I can extract what the letter and the number is for each row, and then uh, run my, um, my action. So, um, using this method, let's go ahead and redo our previous simulation on p-values, but now we'll do uh, look at both the effect of, um, well now we look at the effect of sample size to see if that affects our distribution of p-values. So I'll call this simulation on um, sample sizes. So again, first we want to start by defining the number of simulations, and this is going to be the number of simulations per sample size. And I'll just go with 10,000 again. And now I'm going to create my design matrix. So I'll define design matrix is expand.grid. And the first um, column will be sample size. 
Now you don't want to use spaces here because you can't have a space in a name. I, I don't think you can. Well, maybe I just don't, but either way. So sample size is, and let's say we'll have 10, I don't know, 20, 50, 100, 1,000, ah, 10,000, just to make sure that we find it, if the difference is there. And then sim is 1, 2, and dot sim. Um, I'll run this. I won't look at the whole data frame, but if we just look at the head of it, you can see that it's um, varying sample size, and the sim is yeah still one here. So the next few rows will be the same ones here, but sim two, and then sim three. So we'll have all of them. Okay. Um, the next thing we want to know is just how many complete runs of this um, loop are we going to be doing, and that's just the number of rows in the design matrix. So I'll say total runs is n row of design. And this is just the total number of times we're going to have to run this loop. And which in this case is just going to be the length of sample size times the length of sim. So let's just see how long this is. So we're going to have to do 60,000 loops. Sounds like a lot if you're doing it in Excel, it might take a while, or God forbid SPSS, but in R this should take no problem, or take no time. Okay. Now again, we want to create our placeholder for results. And that'll be p values, and I'm going to define that as repeat na, and we need total runs of these. All right. So now we can start the loop. So for i in one two total runs. Um, so the first thing we need to know is what's the current sample size for this run. So I'm going to say current sample size. And we can get this from the design matrix. So that's design matrix sample size. And we want the ith one of these. OK. And next. And we actually don't need to get the simulation number because the simulation number doesn't, isn't going to change our simulation. Um, it's, the only reason we have this here is so we're going down the matrix. We, really, we just use this to create um, the expand.grid of the full design matrix. We don't really need this number at all. But anyway, uh, so we have our current sample size. So now we can pretty much do the same procedure that we had before. So it's a current sample data. And that's our norm. But now instead of 10 here, we put current sample size. And a mean is 0. SD is 1. I'll just clean this up a bit. OK, now we can define the um, current test is t test of current sample data then current p value is current test p value. And just to, if you're not used to this function, um, let me do a quick example here. So test of a t test on norm 100. And you can see if I look at the names of test, then these are all the outputs, um, or all the elements of this um, test object. So if I just run test, I get all the information in this little table, but I can extract just the p-value by running test p-value. So this is the only value that I want in my simulation. Okay, so I get current p-value, and next I want to update our p-values placeholder, i, again, this was our placeholder, which was going to have all of our final results, and I'm going to assign the current p-value there. And that should complete our simulation. So let me go ahead and reduce the number of simulations to run this, just to make sure it's not taking too long. No errors. OK, that looks good. Um, let's look at headed p values, just to make sure it's looking OK. Yep, looks good. So let's bump this up to 10,000. And it's going to take a little bit of time, because we're doing 60,000 of these. While we're waiting, other people probably can think of ways to speed up a lot of this code. But uh, let's just do it this way, because I think it's a bit clearer. Looks like it's still running. Oh, maybe 10,000 was a bit too much. Um, 
Okay, good, finished. So next what I want to do is I want to update the design matrix with the results of the simulation. So I'll create a new column in design matrix. I'll call it p-value and I'll assign this the p-values. So again, this was the result vector and I'm going to put that in the design matrix. And the next thing I want to do is define um, which p-values are less than or equal to 0.05. So I can do that by saying design matrix p-value less than 05 and that will be p-values less than or equal to 0.05. So if I look at this vector, you can see that I've converted just like I did before. Um, the, p, uh, the exact p-value is an logical, into a logical indicator saying whether it's less than or equal to 0.05. Okay, and that should do it. Now to look at the final result, um, again, I want to aggregate this on each of the um, sample sizes. So I can do that by using t apply. So I'll take final result is with design matrix t apply p value less than 0.5 and the index oh, can't forget the comma and the index will be sample size and then what the mean. Uh, if you're not familiar with the tapply function, um, you can look up the help menu on that. But it's just a way to apply a function, in this case mean, to a variable based on different values of the index variable. Let's go ahead and run this. Okay, I didn't like that. What did I do wrong? Did I just not run this yet? Maybe? Let's try this again. Okay, now it works. I just haven't run this command yet. So let's look at final result. Okay, so now we have our one, two, three, four, five, six different sample sizes, and our proportion of the times that the p-value is less than 0.05, and this looks pretty much the same across all sample sizes. So, looks like the number of samples you take does not affect the interpretation of the p-value. Okay, so the main point of this more complex simulation was the design matrix. So again, I highly recommend doing this instead of trying to run multiple um, uh, loops over multiple different index variables. Just do a single loop over a design matrix and then get the specific variables you want using indexing, like I did here on sample size. Um, so these loops were for running calculations of simulations, but you can do loops to do other things that you're interested in. So for example, um, you can use loops to generate multiple plots. So let's say that you had um, calculated some data uh, or collected data from an experiment where you had collected response time data from many different participants. So for example, let's say there were 100 questions and you had uh, nine participants give some responses to those 100 questions and you recorded the response time for each person. So we have nine subjects, or, uh, I should say participants, and each answered 100 problems and you have response time data for each. And let's say you wanted to create a histogram for each participant. And you want to do this using a loop so you don't have to uh, write the code for each participant. Okay, um, now before actually showing you how to calculate or create the, all the histograms, uh, I'm going to use a loop to actually generate the response time data. And here's how I'm going to do this. Uh, so first, I'm going to create um, the design matrix, so response times, and just like before, expand.grid. And I'll have participant as one um, index. Oops, response, response time. So that's going to be one to nine. And I'll have the response be uh, just 
a bunch of NAs. So this is, um, I'm going to fill this response later with values, but for now I just want um, each participant and that combined with each level of response, which is just um, 100 NAs. So if I look at the head of response times, then I get all the participants and um, their responses. Actually, yeah, this is, actually, maybe I'll call this, no, I'll call this question, sorry. This is a better way to do it. And I'll call this 1, 2, 100. So now, I have participant 1, and it's going to go to, uh, to 9, and then the question number. And the total number, here's the dimensions of this. So we have 900 rows and two columns. Okay, and now I'm going to make another column, response times response, as just NAs. Um, as a shortcut here, you don't need to say repeat NA, you can just use NA. So I'll show you this, and it puts all our NAs there, so it'll repeat that. Okay, um, now I need to know the true rate of each person's response time. Now the reason is because I'm going to use an exponential distribution to represent people's response times. Um, this will make sense in a minute, but first let's say the true rates are, I'll just take e, our unif, um, I need nine of these from zero to one. So if we look at these values, this will be the true um, uh, rate, uh, mean response rate, of, or sorry, not the mean response rate, but the each person's yeah true rate of response. Okay, so now I'll create our, our my loop. So for i and one to our so now I should say um, and runs is then row of response times. Now for i and one to n runs, now I define my action. So first I say that the current participant is response times participant i, and the current response rate is response times or, nope, that's not what I want. I want um, the true rates and um, current participant. So just to show you how this works, so for example, I have true rates here. If I'm the current participant is participant three, then it's gonna give me the third um, index of true rates, which would be one, two, three, so it would give me 0.04. Okay. So now I can generate the response. So response times response i, and I assign this to REXP, which is the a random draw from the exponential distribution, and the n is just one, and the rate is going to be current response rate. I'll make this look a little bit nicer. Eh, not so much nicer. Okay. And that should do it. So let me go ahead and run this. Hopefully no errors. Good. So now if I look at head of response times, then we can see that I have the, yeah, the participant question that I had before, but now I've generated a response. And again, the way I did that was I looped through n run, one to n runs, which is um, the entire matrix. And for each element i, I pulled the current participant which, for example, for i equals 1 was participant 1. I determined what that person's uh, true response rate is by looking at the true rates up here and taking the index of the current participant, which I got previously. And then I just, from that, I drew one sample from an exponential distribution, sample size 1, with a rate equal to the current response rate. And then I assigned that to response times response of i, which is up here. Okay. So um, now I can use a loop to create a histogram for each of these participants. So let's create a histogram response times for each P. I'll just say P. Um, now I could create nine different histograms in separate plots, 
but it'd be nicer if I had them all uh, set up together in a matrix. Uh, so the way you can do that is by using the MF row parameter. And I'm going to have a 3x3 three three matrix, matrix of um, uh, plots. So just to show you how that looks, if I run this, nothing will happen. But then if I create a bunch of plots, for example, plot number one, you can see that it's just created a 3x3 three three plotting region. So the first plot I run will put it on the top left. If I run it again, the next plot will show up here. If I run it again, and I can run this nine times, and it will fill up the plotting region. OK, so let me just quickly clear this. And, oops, rerun the par in the row. I don't even know if I need to rerun it, but I'm a bit superstitious. So now we want to create a loop for i and 1 to 9 participants. And for each of the participants, Let's get the data. So the data for participant i, we get it from the response times. Response time. Eh, probably a bad idea to include a variable name that looks almost exactly like the name of the data frame, but oh well, that's how I did it. Um, and I just want the response times where response time, oh god, this was really stupid of me to name it like this, participant equals i. So again, uh, what I could say is, yeah, so current, I could say current participant is i, but that's a bit, I don't really need that. So I'll just remember that i is the current participant. Okay, I just want to make sure I did this right. So uh, let's say i is 1. If I run this, yeah, that's what I figured. I did something wrong. So it should be response times, response time. Or no, it's just response, not response time. Ah, see, this is that was really not very smart of me. Um, this should be times. Okay, that fixed it. So for I1, participant 1, this is their 100 response times. Okay, good, that worked. Um, now I want to get a little bit fancier, so I'm going to say, um, well, now we'll start by something a bit easier. So we'll, now I'll just say hist of data.i, and that's it. Let's run this. So it's taking data i for each participant and create a history. There we go. Easy. Uh, but if we want to get a bit fancier, we might want to say, well, median. Let's, um, let's add a vertical line that shows where the median of each person's data point is. And let's actually add the name uh, of the participant also in the header and put the median value of that participant's data also in the header. So median i is, let's round it, median data.i. And now to the histogram, let's add a few things. Let's say that uh, first xlim is c of 0 of 40. Let's make the x limits for all the plots the same. Oh, what else? Let's make the main is paste. If you don't use paste before, it just combines um, new, uh, string vectors or combined strings, participant space i, and then this um, dat slash n, this creates um, another row. You'll see what this does in a second. Uh, median equals median dot i, and then I have to add sep equals none. Uh, if you don't quite understand how that works, um, you'll just have to look at the help menu for paste, but you'll see how it works in a minute. A comma. Uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger so we can actually see what we're doing. And that's it. And the second thing I want to do is add a vertical red line for each plot that shows the median. I can do that using add line. So v equals median dot i. Uh, color equals red. And let's make it thick. L W D L W D is three. I think that's all that I want. Do I have an extra? No? Okay, let's see if this works. So I'll run this. Hey, doesn't look too bad. So uh, we can see for each graph now, we have the participant's uh, number in the header and their median value. Again, the way I got it to have the median one line below participant was by including this slash n. 
Uh, we have a red vertical line for the median on each person. Um, yeah. Uh, we can see for some of these, participant three, wow, this person had a crazy high um, median. Strange. So that's why the histogram looks so messed up. Uh, it's because I uh, truncated it from 0 to 40. So if I got rid of this, um, let's just get rid of this hard-coded XLIM altogether, then I should be able to see the full histogram for each person. Yeah. So now it looks a bit cleaner because for participant 3, which again for some reason has this extraordinarily high response times, must be in... Let's look at my response times again, or the true rates. Okay, yeah, so participant 3, their rate is extremely small, and because the mean values um, will be the inverse of this, this person's mean is something like 1 over 500. So, uh, yeah, now that I see that, it's not so surprising that their median was so high. Um, okay, so um, that's how you create a simple histogram of um, to create histograms for each of different participants, um, and also before we had the brief simulations. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind when doing loops is uh, they're not always the most efficient way to um, run some to run analyses, and also sometimes they can lead to ugly looking code. So for example, um, our loop before to create the numbers one to 10, it would have been much simpler to use uh, just 1 to 10 instead of running this. So if your loop seems to be quite simple, um, make sure there's not a function that can already do it much simpler. Um, the second thing is before running your simulation, I encourage you to create a placeholder that's gonna, that you can use to store the iterated results of your simulation. So in this case, I created a placeholder of um, NAs, uh, 10,000 of them, and then as I'm running my simulation, I update that placeholder with the uh, newest simulation value that I'm interested in. Uh, and again, if you have multiple index variables, instead of running multiple loops, I encourage you to create a design matrix that has all the combinations of your indices that you're interested in. Uh, let's move down to this one. And then uh, instead of running two loops, just run one loop over the rows of your design matrix. And then for each one of these loops, you can extract the specific values of your index variables that you're interested in. Uh, for me, this is just a much uh, more, much easier to see way of uh, running loops over multiple indices rather than running uh, multiple different uh, loops. Uh, and the last thing is, if your loop is taking a long time to run, it might be a good idea to include some code in your loop that outputs um, how far along things are going. So for example, let's, let's look at this one. This one took us a little while. So I could add uh, print, um, let's print a message, I out of, um, how many total simulations were there in this one? Uh, total runs. Uh, set is nothing. Okay, so let's run this again. And now, when I run this simulation, it's going to, for each iteration, print out what the current iteration is and add up the total. And it didn't like something I did here. Um, Invalid digits argument print. Aha, uh -huh. I shouldn't have closed that. So if I run this, now it looks good. Okay, so let's rerun this. And we see that it's printing out each value. Um, so now at least I know if I'm waiting a while that it actually is making progress on this and that there's not some infinite loop that it's stuck in during the process. And if you want to get a bit fancier with this, you can tell it to only print out the value if, for example, the current iteration is a multiple of 1,000. So now instead of uh, printing out every single one, it'll only print out 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Um, that's a little bit nicer way to do it than having it print out each iteration. So yeah, that's how you do some simple um, loops in R.